When you think of the word autism, what images come to mind for you? Do you think of the puzzle symbol, a sad child, or maybe another symbol? In this episode of the Water Prairie Chronicles, I'm going to talk about some of the more common symbols used to represent autism and the history and meaning behind them. For the past month, I've been learning more about autism by talking with autistic adults about their lives and trying to get a better understanding of autism in general. Since April is Autism Acceptance Month, we've been focused on bringing topics related to autism to the weekly podcast to help our listeners become more accepting of autistic children and adults that they know and to help provide some resources for parents who have young autistic children. If you've missed any of this month's episodes, be sure to go back and meet in episode 10, Nicole Schlechter. She's the creator of the IEP Parent Academy, and she's the mother of an autistic son. She talks a lot about um, how to advocate for your child in school. So, um, so I'd recommend that you go back and look at that one. Also in episode 11, we met Justin Husick. He's the owner of ASD With Me. He's an adult who was diagnosed with autism when he was an adult and he's been using what he's learned about himself and about autism to help mentor others in his community. And in episode 12, we met Jennifer Faltzgraf. She's the executive director of the Arc of the Triangle, and she's the mother of a son with cerebral palsy. So she talks a lot about what the Arc has to offer for parents of autistic children. And then last week, we explored the role of stemming in autistic children and adults, and Justin Husick returned for episode 13 with us to help analyze some of the comments that we gathered through an online discussion with autistic adults. Today, I'd like to close out the series by looking at some of the symbols used to represent autism, and I want to talk about the meanings that they communicate to different people. I'm finding very different reactions to the different symbols, and I invite you to leave comments in the section below so that you can join in the conversation. I'd love to hear your input on this. You may love it, you may hate it, but we're only going to learn from each other if we share what we're thinking. But I do ask that you remember that this is a family-friendly forum and that we keep the language clean and make it positive comments. So um, constructive criticism is great. I love to hear that. And I want you to have the opportunity to be able to leave your comments. But let's, let's remember that we have young parents that are reading this and we don't want to discourage anyone through our conversation. So let's get into it. So before we look at the symbols, I thought maybe it would help if we could look at some of the history of autism. I don't know about you, but for me, I don't remember even being aware of the word autism or have heard of anyone being autistic until I was in college in the 1980s. If you heard about it sooner than that, leave a comment below because I'm really curious what everyone's past is on this. And so I thought for me it would be helpful and I'm going to share what I've learned with you to go back and see what's the history here. When did it begin officially? How was it first diagnosed? And how has it transformed through the years as they've learned more about it? Because I'm sure you're aware that with anything over time, we learn more and we should be making changes based on what we're learning. And I'm starting to think that some of the negative conversations that I'm seeing are based on a lot of misunderstandings that are out there by neurotypical people. And so if we can't wrap our head around what another person is thinking, it's a little bit harder for us to put ourselves in their shoes but it's also easier for us to draw some conclusions that are inaccurate. So I'm going to share with you what I've learned online. I've just gone in and looked at some sources that I found. So first of all, I went to the encyclopedia. I'm in my 50s. Growing up, we were always told to go to the encyclopedia. So we started there. So I went to Britannica.com and I found that Donald Gray Triplett was the first person documented as being diagnosed with autism. According to the article, Triplett was born in 1933. He was the oldest son of a wealthy family in Mississippi, and from an early age, it doesn't necessarily say what age it was, but from an early age, it was evident that social communications were a challenge and they weren't interesting to him. Apparently, he had developmental delays and he would fixate on specific objects and showed a knack for memorizing information. He was born in 33. In 37, so four years later, his parents placed him in a state institution, but they withdrew him the following year. That year, Triplett was evaluated by Dr. Leo, I don't know if it's pronounced Kanner or Kaner, it's K-A-N-N-E-R. I'm going to put the references to any of these articles in the notes below so you, you can check it yourself because I want you to see where it's coming from. But um, but Dr., I'm going to call him Kanner. I may, may be saying it wrong. I apologize to him and to any of his descendants. Um, but he was a child psychiatrist at Johns, Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. He noticed similarities to schizophrenia but he didn't find enough evidence to diagnose Triplett with it. 
And by 1943, so this was uh, when Triplet would have been about 10, Kanner had seen 10 other children with similar behaviors, and he published an article titled Autistic Disturbances of Effective Contact. And it gave the basic symptoms of what later became known as autism. So Triplet was sent to live on a farm with another family for four years soon after this point when the article came out, because it says when he was about 11. And that environment allowed him to use his skills of counting and measuring in a practical way as he helped with the chores around the farm. He went on later to earn a bachelor's degree in French, and he worked at the bank that his family owned. He also was able to drive, and he enjoyed travel around the world. So he had a fulfilling life, it sounds like. He was diagnosed early, and but it sounds like his family had some good ideas as far as where to place him to help him learn how to thrive. All right, so looking more at the history of autism, I found an article at, I'm going to say it's otsimo.com. It's O-T-S-I-M-O.com. And it had a good summary that I thought I'd, I'd share a little bit of what I learned from that. So according to the article, after Canner's diagnosis in 1943, autism became known as a form of childhood schizophrenia with a detachment from reality. The definition for autism being that child that it was childhood schizophrenia with a detachment from reality, that continued into the 1960s. So this was a 20 year span where that was the diagnosis. In the 1970s, different studies resulted in the cause possibly being rooted in the development of the brain. And in 1980, so this was closer to when I started hearing about it, autism was described in the third edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, referred to as the DSM. So from here on, I'm going to say DSM, but this was in the third edition. And it was described as, quote, pervasive developmental disorder, end quote, and a separate diagnosis from schizophrenia. So this was in 1980 was the first time that it was separated from schizophrenia. The diagnosis was based on the observation of three things. So it had to have these three the severe communication impairment, no interest in people, and unusual responses to the environment. And all three of those observations had to be made in the first two and a half years of life. In 1987, the criteria for a diagnosis of autism were revised to add the diagnosis of, quote, mild autism, end quote, or, quote, pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, and that was referred to as PDD-NOS, end quote. And the requirement to see the behaviors within the first two and a half years of age was removed. So by 87, that's where it was. And that actually is probably about the time that I first heard of it, because I graduated from college in 87 and was working in education. And so I would have come in contact in the school at that point. So the idea of autism being a spectrum disorder began in 1994 with the fourth edition of the DSM. And at that time, Asperger's syndrome was added to the diagnosis of autism and PDD NOS. And the fourth edition also added Rett syndrome, where movement and communication are affected, and childhood disintegrative disorder, or CDD, where severe developmental reversal is seen. In 1998, an article was published in The Lancet that suggested that the MMR vaccine may cause autism. After other studies disproved the theory, the publication retracted the article. The retraction was not until many years later, I believe it was in 2010. In 1999, the Autism Society adopted the Autism Awareness Puzzle Ribbon as a sign of autism awareness. And the Autism Society is in, I believe, London. It's not in the U.S. In 2000, vaccine manufacturers removed thimerosal because it was a mercury-based preservative used in vaccines, and the public was still afraid vaccines caused autism. So 1998 was when the Lancet publication posted the study that suggested that the MMR vaccine may cause autism. And I don't know about you, but today I still hear people telling me that vaccines cause autism. The damage that was done in that one article is still going on now, all these years later. All right, so let's see, where were we? That was 2000. So in 2009, one in 110 children were estimated to have autism in the U.S., according to the CDC. And then in 2013, the fifth edition of the DSM changed the diagnosis of autism to be under one diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, or ASD, and they did away with the Asperger syndrome diagnosis. So currently, there are two categories of ASKD, impaired social communication, and restricted and repetitive behaviors. And that explains a little bit more to me because I've been seeing more restrictive and repetitive behaviors notes as I'm going through some of the research. So, um, so there's several different links that I'm going to post below of where all that, that data came from, just so you can look at the source of where it came from. But it kind of gives you an overview there of 
if you didn't hear about autism until more recent years or like me in the 80s, that explains a little bit more of it because it was not called autism until around, well, autism was being used, but it was not used commonly until into the 80s. And then even more so as you may have heard Asperger's, but it was a short time that they used that before they took that back away. So like anything else, as science is learning more, as autistic adults are speaking out more about their experiences and their thoughts on things, I think we're going to see more revisions to this. And I think it's good because it means that we're using what we know and we're learning more as we go as well. So history aside, let's let's look at some of the symbols. The symbols, um, well, in, in the notes below in the comment section, I want you to put what symbol first comes to mind for you whenever you first think about autism. If you've seen something, put, put it down there. I'm just curious what's going on there. It'll be interesting to see how many have specific symbols that they've seen or even colors if there's a color that you see more because I'm finding that as well but I'm going to look at a few of the things that I found so when I just put in autism symbol online and did some searches I found that um, more recently there are symbols for uh, butterfly or for the infinity symbol older ones have shown up as the puzzle piece but I don't know about you whenever I drive around and I see a sticker on the back of someone's car that's for autism awareness especially and not acceptance I see the puzzle piece. I see moms wearing t-shirts with a puzzle piece on it. I see children wearing that. I see a lot of jewelry for moms, bracelets and necklaces showing that they're an autism mom that are usually a puzzle piece. So I went on to Amazon and just did a search and I found a lot of puzzle pieces, a little bit of other symbols, but more puzzle pieces than anything else. And then when I went on to Etsy, it was actually, Etsy surprised me because when I put in autism symbol on Etsy, I started seeing more of the infinity symbol, but I think that's Etsy may be a little bit more current than Amazon. And I'll put some links below of some of the things that I found so that if you want to go and look, you can. And if you, if you go, I am an affiliate for both Amazon and Etsy. So if you use my links below, it will help to support the channel. Even, even if you don't buy anything, if you just go and look at it, it's not going to cost you anymore. It's just the links give credit to the channel for using that. So let's look a little bit. So we have the infinity symbol. So if you don't know what an infinity symbol looks like, and if you're listening on the podcast, then you can't see the picture that I'm showing you right now. It's a sideways eight. It almost looks like a butterfly, um, but it's just a sideways eight. And the more common one that I see has rainbow colors involved with it. They may be in the swirl or they might be coming across it. So the rainbow colors represent the range of symptoms for autistics, and they might be displayed as the infinity symbol or a ribbon or a puzzle piece. So the rainbow colors themselves, um, this is saying, is representing the, the symptoms, but the infinity is, um, well, we, we, we can get into that in just a minute because I think I've got more information on that. The next image that I found um, was a blue background with the white outline of a light bulb and a white puzzle piece where the filament is for the light bulb. And um, the phrase that came with that was lighted up blue. And that symbol is associated with the Autism Speaks organization. And it's usually seen on Autism Awareness Day in early April each year. I think it's around April 2nd. Um, the lighted up blue campaign asked people to promote autism awareness by wearing blue on that date. And because blue is a calming color, it's the organization's primary color to help encourage acceptance in a loud and busy world. So that's um, just a general one there. And for those who have strong feelings about different organizations, I'm not endorsing any organizations as I'm talking about these. I'm just describing what the symbols are and where they may have come from. The next symbol that I have is a white puzzle that has one piece missing and the background behind it is blue and then it has the word autism at the bottom and it says the puzzle piece became popular because of its use by Autism Speaks. It has both a positive and a negative reaction by different individuals. Some feel it gives the idea of autistics not fitting in to social circles and find it offensive. Others consider it showing how we are all connected and we complete the puzzle when we're all accepted. Then the next image is a butterfly and the wings of the butterfly are made out of different colored puzzle pieces. It says the butterfly is a newer symbol for autism and exemplifies the beauty of diversity and continued development. And then the last image that I have here is just a gray infinity symbol. And it says the infinity symbol itself. We talked about the col the rainbow color in the first one, but this one talks about the symbol itself. It says the symbol is often displayed with the colors of the rainbow and represents inclusivity for people on the spectrum. So the fact that it continues to 
to move, I think is maybe why that's saying that it's um, including all with it. And I've also seen that gold can be used because the symbol for the element gold is AU and that's how autism begins. So some, some will use the color gold for it. So I'll put, put, put the link of where those symbols all came from so you can see where that was and get a little more information there. So the most common symbols I've run across recently are the puzzle piece and the infinity symbol. So I wanted to examine these closer and get some reactions to what they might imply for autistic adults. I've seen the puzzle piece longer, so I'm going to start with that one. Autism Speaks is the most popular organization to use it today, and it's done so since it was founded in 2005. They use a blue puzzle piece that helps raise awareness for autism, and they've been very effective and making the symbol popular. Most people recognize the puzzle piece as a symbol of autism, and I've seen it on t-shirts, jewelry, car stickers for years. Puzzle piece was first used in 1963 by the National Autistic Society in London. And from their website, I found the following. <clears throat> I'm just going to read this to you because it's going to be harder to try to edit it for you. So it says, it was designed by a parent member of the executive committee, Gerald Gasson, and the minutes of the executive meeting of 14 February 1963 read, quote, the committee decided that the symbol of the society should be the puzzle as this did not look like any other commercial or charitable one as far as they could discover, end quote. So they came up with the puzzle just because it didn't look like anything else. <laughs> So it says, it first appeared on our stationery and then on our newsletter in April 1963. Our society was the first autistic society in the world, and our puzzle piece has, as far as I know, been adopted by all the autistic societies which have followed, many of which in their early days turned to us for information and, and advice. The puzzle piece is so effective because it tells us something about autism. Our children are handicapped by a puzzling condition. This isolates them from normal human contact and therefore they do not, quote, fit in, end quote. The suggestion of a weeping child is a reminder that autistic people do indeed suffer from their handicap. If in the future we can invest in our society even more thought, effort, and commitment, our puzzle piece will, at least in this country, become no longer just a logo on a letterhead, but a symbol of hope for autistic people and their families. All right, so that was directly from their website, and I'm going to post that below so you can see where it came from. Again, as I said earlier, I am not giving endorsement of what's being said, but I do want you to keep in mind that part of what I just read can be offensive to many, but Remember, this was written in 1963, so it um, it was from information that was understood at the time, and we have evolved a bit since then, so keep, keep that in mind. So <clears throat> I thought I would take what the puzzle piece symbol meant and ask some autistic adults that I was able to talk to what their response was for that. One of the responses that I received, this one's fairly long, but I'm going to read, read them to you as they were written to me just so that you're hearing their words and not mine. So the first response was, quote, the puzzle piece has connotations of us having something missing and being a puzzle to others. Basically, it centers on their non-autistic perspectives of us rather than our own. Though it's not just the symbol that is an issue, it's the history of so-called autism charities that have used the symbol and how they treat autistic people. Generally, the autistic community prefers autistic person terminology instead of a person with autism and dislikes the puzzle symbol. I found it interesting because I didn't get the same response from every autistic adult that I talked to. So another one responded by saying, for me, it symbolized that although I am different and may not fit in my current social situation, job, etc., there is a place for me with the perfect fit because no puzzle piece is made that doesn't fit somewhere. So I thought that was, that was interesting. So they're looking at it that the puzzle piece is representing them and the puzzle is not complete without them there and there's a specific place that they fit in. So um, so it's a positive for, the, for them. So we had another that wrote in, I love the puzzle piece symbol. And again, remember, these are all autistic adults. These are not neurotypical adults answering this. These are autistic adults telling me this. So I love the puzzle piece symbol. My belief is that every person on the planet has something to offer, no matter their background or circumstance. And I see myself and everyone and everything as being a missing piece to the greater puzzle of life's meaning. So I, I, I like the way that they worded that. The last one that I was going to share is, as an autistic person myself, my stance is that I don't like the singular blue puzzle piece used by Autism Speaks. However, the multicolored puzzle ribbon that has existed longer, I rather like it, quite honestly. So um, so we had more that responded that they liked the puzzle, but they're looking at the puzzle piece as representing something different than what it was originally intended to be. And I think that's okay, because as I say, we're evolving on this. 
So let's set aside the puzzle piece and look at the other one. So the more recent one that I've been seeing a lot is the infinity symbol. And again, that's that sideways eight that goes around if you're not a mathematics person and remember your infinity symbol for math. It's been in the rainbow colors most of the time, but sometimes it's also the gold infinity symbol. The reactions that I found for the infinity symbol are as follows. The first place that I went, because I did not have many people answer my direct questions on the infinity symbol, I looked online to see what I could find. And um, there's an article on studybreaks.com J.R. Brenner made the following statement about the use of the infinity symbol. So J.R. writes, As our understanding of autism has evolved, we've learned that it's a spectrum of completely different needs and experiences for each autistic individual. People in the autistic community don't see themselves as having any, quote, missing pieces, end quote, or being, quote, too puzzling, end quote, to fit into society. After all, I don't think it's much of a stretch to say that a puzzle piece symbol reflects how we're a problem to solve instead of people who just want to be accepted and understood. Then I found on the goodautismschool.com site another description referring to that. It says, February 2018, the puzzle piece ceased to be the universally accepted autism symbol. Instead of the puzzle piece symbol, a rainbow colored infinity symbol is used to represent diversity. This symbol has come to represent the need for us to be more sensitive to changes that lead to better lives and results for individuals with autism and their families. This change in the representation of the symbol also guarantees cooperation and sharing between between the rest of society and individuals with autism. And then I checked in with my friend Justin. Just out of curiosity, I asked him, you know, what was his feeling on it? And he said that the infinity symbol seems to be a better and more acceptable representation. I look at it as we have infinite possibilities. And I, I like that, that infinite possibilities is much better than trying to fit someone into a preformed area with the puzzle. So that's my own take on that. I'm not not passing judgment on anyone. That's just whenever I look at the two, I feel like, again, as, as we've evolved, we've kept the colors, the diversity with the colors, but I like that infinite possibilities. Then I found on LinkedIn an article that I thought was interesting. And the article, I believe, was called um, Awareness Pride Evolution Autism Symbols from 1963. And this was posted by Amber Johnson. And she pointed out, Created by neurodiversity advocates, the rainbow infinity symbol was initially used to represent Autistic Pride Day on June 18, 2005, and founded by Aspies for Freedom. The symbol intended to reflect diversity with infinite variations and infinite possibilities, and that's become widespread and, bel and beloved. So <clears throat> that was all that I could find as far as in direct response to this. I would love to hear your reactions to these. Again, if you haven't done so yet, put in the comments whether you prefer the puzzle piece, prefer the infinity symbol. I'd love to hear why. Um, let's let's start some conversations down there. So um, so this is a way that you can join in and put your, your input on this. I'd also like to know if there are topics like this that you'd like for us to dig deeper in. Doesn't have to be on autism. Um, Water Prairie Chronicles is looking at all different types of disabilities. And I know that autistic individuals are not necessarily disabled. There are some that have developmental disabilities or communication disabilities that may begin young and are resolved, um, but we do include autistic individuals with Water Prayer Chronicles because there are many delays, especially with those young children. And again, just a reminder that the podcast is intended primarily for parents of young children who have disabilities. So this is why we've tried to focus for the month of April on autistic topics and just autism related information to try to get our parents that are having children who are autistic to try to get them into some more resources. But I'd love to hear other topics that you'd like to have us explore. And we're beginning to get more resources and um, contacts so we can dig deeper into this. But for the, the near future, we're going to be looking at some other topics as well. We have, um, we've told you about Dr. Wegner that's going to be coming on to talk about her Brody the Lion series. We're also going to be talking during that interview about the importance of early diagnosis with autism. So, um, so parents who have autistic children, um, watch for that coming up in May. We've been in touch with some outdoor resources to try to help you find out more about possibly some camps that you can look at for your children, but also some activities that as a family you can do outdoors. So we're going to try and look at that some this summer. And um, and we have some, some other variety of interviews coming up. So um, if you haven't 
found it yet, if you go to the water, waterprairie.com website and look on the podcast list, you'll see some of the upcoming ones as we get the topics, we, we're filling that in. Right now, it's it, it's not filled in very far, but I'm trying to stay ahead on that. And then also, if you look on the podcast resources page, you'll have per episode all of the links that we have. And this week, we've just added a shopping page as well. And again, if you use any of the links that are Amazon or Etsy, and there may be some others that we add over time, those are affiliate links, and they do give credit to the site. So if something's purchased through those, then it'll help support the podcast so that we can continue bringing you more information and resources. So thank you for listening. I appreciate you giving us the time today. I hope that you've learned something. I know I learned a, a lot during the month of April about autism, and I feel like I'm understanding more as I meet people, as I meet parents that have young children. I'm not having the mindset of thinking that I have the right answers for them, but understanding that every child is different, and this is the case with everything. We need to be encouraging our, our parents who are raising our next generation. So be sensitive to them, give them the support that you can, give us a thumbs up if you're getting value from this and share this with someone that you know that might benefit from it. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week.